Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. Anda sedang menonton Sudut Pandang. Saya berbangga kerana hari ini saya ada uh, akan menemui ramah seorang pemenang hadiah Nobel tahun 2003 dalam uh, hadiah ekonomi sebenarnya. Dan uh, oleh kerana ekonomi dunia sekarang ini sedang dilanda pelbagai ketidakpastian, tentunya ini akan memberikan sedikit uh, maklumat kepada kita tentang bagaimana harus kita melihat tentang kegawatan yang dikatakan sudah pun menjengak malah ke Asia sekalipun dan adakah kita berada di penghujungnya adakah kita sekarang sedang meningkat untuk keluar dan sebagainya oleh itu saya ingin meminta izin untuk berbicara dalam bahasa Inggeris uh, thank you very much uh, uh, professor robert engel for being here today yeah, you are the winner of uh, the 2003 nobel prize for economics you are also one of the most influential academics in the business world as uh, given tribute to you by portfolio you can go to portfolio.com to check that out <laughs> volatility is something that any normal human being will be worried about and uh, especially in the financial and economic uh, industry these are the words that uh, bring fear to people because we want to be sure that when we put a certain amount of money the money will not uh, be smaller in a few years time but it will become bigger and bigger and bigger but uh, you never know in this kind of market That's right. but uh, volatility is a passion and also a dedication of yours you have been given uh, the uh, Nobel Prize for that and uh, what is this uh, arch that we've been hearing so much about about this auto regressive conditional heteroskedisticity and uh, how you measure uh, volatility with time and all that if you can please explain that then I can proceed to the other bigger issues that we have well thank you that's uh, it's very nice to be here and uh, let me give it a try to see if I can say in a simple way what this arch model is about it's really a way of trying to predict risk. And that's particularly important in the financial markets. And as you said, volatility is the risk for an investor. Whether their position is going to go up or down in value is something they care a great deal about. And it turns out that volatility is changing over time. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, but it's predictable. And so what the ARCH model does is try to predict volatility using a couple of very simple features of financial markets. One is that when it's high, it tends to stay high, and when it's low, it tends to stay low. A simple idea. And the second is, eventually, it tends to come back to normal. And so what the ARCH model does is try to figure out how long it's going to take it to come back to normal. And so it measures the volatility over time and predicts where it's likely to go. How do you look at the subprime crisis because a lot of hedge fund managers and, and big fund managers and also derivative uh, executives, they didn't see this coming. Right. Or some people have been given uh, warnings, but uh, none that was convincing enough to make them go out enough, uh, I mean, in, in, in leeway of having the hindsight of seeing it. But uh, this is what you are measuring. And how do you see this now? Right. I, I think it's one of the, the facts that we have to explain is why did people take so much of their their portfolio and put it into these subprime securities and other securities when in fact it was well known that there was a lot of risk in these in these markets and I think the answer is that they used new sophisticated derivative instruments and these derivative instruments uh, were able to give the illusion of protection from, from risk. That is, that some of the things called CDOs and credit default swaps mm -hmm. were designed so that you could both buy insurance against the downside yeah. of these positions and that you would not be the person that takes the first hit. Other people would take the first hit. And it turned out that if you analyze these things in a simple framework, they really were very good at avoiding the risk. Mm -hmm. But if you analyze them in a more complex, mm -hmm. realistic framework, you could see where the risks mm -hmm. uh, so really take. I, I want to see it from a simple <coughs> term. You know, the subprime itself, it's a term being, being uh, used for a group of people that's not the primary target for, for a loan because they don't really qualify. Mm -hmm. But uh, you lower the, the uh, entrance levels that they can go and get uh, and mortgage mm -hmm. and have mortgages. Right. And then 
one institution will you know put that in and package it again and sell it to another and like what you say there's an insurance against that and not only is it sold in America it's even being invested in by people in Europe and all that so this complex mechanism it comes from the market you are in the academia institution is it one of the main systemic failure was that the market went too fast and too far ahead that the rest of the people, as in the regulators, for example, and also the academics, didn't have the time to really look at it and see what's wrong with it and give advice. Was that what happened? I, I, I think that's a good explanation for it. I think that this is, this is a uh, financial innovation which got ahead of the risk managers and the regulators and the uh, rating agencies. They all didn't have enough time to do the research to figure out where the risks really were. So, I, but I think we're always going to have innovation like that. And I think these innovations actually were valuable innovations. I think it's wonderful that there are homeowners in the U.S. that previously would not have qualified for a loan who were able to buy a house. Now, many of these didn't turn out very well, which is too bad, but I think it's, it's a great thing that, that they were able to... Um, the idea was good. The intention was The idea was, good. was to let this happen. With hindsight, what can we change? That it does, well, I think you know. there's some things we can change. I think that one of the interesting ideas is what sometimes is called the Spanish system, which says that regulation should make banks more cautious when the economy is doing well so that you tighten the restrictions on banks when, when the, they're making a lot of money and then you re-loosen loose, those restrictions when the economy is doing badly and this is sort of the opposite of what happens naturally that, and it's this pendulum that swings too far that you were, you were talking about that I think uh, would would be improved by this. I think a second thing that we should really do is we should have more transparency as to how some of these uh, derivatives markets are actually take place. The over-the-counter market in the United States is a very big but opaque market. You don't really know how much business is being done, who is providing insurance, for example, how big the positions are people are taking. Just to give an example of how bad it is, some economies, even until now, they don't dare to call where the bottom is. You know, some have called it. You know, are we in the middle of it? Are we seeing the end of it? You know, are we going to see more bad students than AIG? And now we're focusing in the, in the states at the auto industry and looking whether they're going to have built outs or not. But how do you see it? Is this near the end? You know, everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. And economists, I think can reasonably disagree as to where we are in the cycle. Uh, we've seen a lot of bad news, but especially recently, this starting in September, what happened I think is that the rest of the world, global economy started to turn down in response to the U.S. downturn and so that the U.S. no longer could have some confidence in the export sector uh, pulling us out. We, we weren't going to see that kind of growth and the consumer in the U.S. and the consumer in the rest of the world has felt their wealth decline by a dramatic amount. So I think the consumers have stopped spending as well. Mm -hmm. And that immediately hurt the global economy mm -hmm. which relies on a lot of exports. So. I think what's happened is we are now in a situation where the, the whole global economy is moving in sync. Unfortunately, it's in the down direction. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how long is that likely to last? That's what you'd like to know. I think the stock market's dramatic fall since September has been lowering their expectations for what's going to happen to the global economy. And uh, whether they've lowered them as much as they're going to? I'm not sure. But I think the big drop has happened. But I don't think that the economy is going to, the global economy is going to recover in the near future. I think all we can see on the horizon is sort of bad news. Is Asia really, you know, decoupled from what's happening in Europe and, and North America? And the other thing is, how do we differentiate between real economy and the financial market derivative? Because 
people say that there should be a fine line that's uh, distinguishing these two sides because otherwise what happened before can happen again. All that with the winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics 2003 after this short break. Hi, you're still watching Suruk Pandang and uh, welcome back. And uh, I'm here with Professor Robert Engel. He's the winner of the uh, uh, Nobel Prize for Economics 2003. He's also a professor of finance at NYU, New York University. And um, I would like to say thanks to the International Peace Foundation who made it possible because uh, they have this Bridges series which tries to have dialogues towards a culture of peace and uh, I'm, I'm going to see more Nobel Prize winners coming, hopefully, from the foundation and we can have more dialogue like this. But for today, we're focusing on economics especially and uh, there's this saying that uh, Asia is decoupled from Europe and North America especially in terms of economy. But some others are saying, this is globalization working. You can't have one area in the world where the economy is bad and the rest of the area in the world is not affected because it's all interrelated. Can you clear this up for us? Which one should we look at, really? I'm afraid we're all in it together now. We are all in it together. <laughs> the, uh, the, the hope that Asia and, and Europe perhaps could avoid this recession, I think, has gone by. The, uh, the downturn is now everywhere. You can see it in the stock markets everywhere, and you can see it in the real economies everywhere. So many of the activities we do in these countries are involved in trade. Mm -hmm. So much of what you produce in Malaysia is exported to the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. There is no, it seems to me, it's, there is no hope that you can continue to have the kind of uh, business opportunities that you've had in the past when, when the, uh, the, mar the, the market, market, that the market has gone down. Uh, so, I don't think there's any hope for decoupling. In fact, what, I, what I'm hoping is that the economies of the world will move in a strong, concerted direction to stop this before it gets more serious. How, how do you look at Because the first reaction, especially in, in countries in Asia, is to concentrate their budget towards uh, uh, growing domestic demand, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you see that one of the bad impact of what happened with the subprime crisis is that People are looking more inward now, as, uh, as in, uh, for example, Malaysia will look more at its, its domestic forces and at the same time looking less towards uh, North America and Europe, but more towards China within Asia, for example. Is that one of the better strategies? Well, I, I, think, I think in a big picture, we can see that this last decade has been an excellent decade for the world. Mm -hmm. The economies all over the world have grown in a dramatic fashion, particularly some of the economies like India and China that were in really serious poverty 10 years ago have grown to become major economic players. And I think the important question to ask is, is that over? What caused that? And is it the same thing that made that happen caused this instability. Because I think a lot of the instability we have now is because the financial markets were liberalized, mm -hmm. money was able to flow to economies all over the world, mm -hmm. and perhaps has now coming back. We're all looking inward. Mm -hmm. There is a pressure to, to pay attention to your domestic economy rather than the global economy. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that we are going to give up all these benefits of globalization mm -hmm just because of the instability. And I would much prefer to find ways of improving the stability of the system rather than throw out all these benefits. Mm -hmm. I think not uh, since Bretton Woods after the World War yeah. II that a lot of people are so concerned about the economy of the world and are putting their heads together, mm -hmm. academics, uh, people who are in charge of policies, and uh, 
but before we go, what possible solutions are there? How have they separate financial market dealings with real economy, for example? Right. Because suddenly the price of a commodity for, for, for ton of uh, palm oil will shoot up from 350 US dollars to 2,500 US dollars and with no apparent supply and demand uh, changes. So financial market terms do influence uh, the real Absolutely. economy. And Absolutely. do you think this should be you know, changed and be more well regulated to lessen the volatility, for example? Well, my feeling is that a lot of volatility is just response to new information. Mm -hmm. And so volatility is neither good nor bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it hurts us as investors, but it also helps us because it means that countries and companies that are mm -hmm. doing well can have prices that go up faster than ones that are doing badly. And that's important function of the financial markets. Mm -hmm. So when you see prices change dramatically, to some extent, this is a reflection of the new information. Mm -hmm. And this commodity price boom that you're talking about, I think, was fueled by this, these growth expectations. And people started to realize the economy is growing so fast. How can yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. supply of commodities keep up cool. with it? So their prices are going to go up. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that maybe speculative yeah. bubbles mm -hmm. and stuff like that, which would be an excess. Mm -hmm. But I think a part of volatility, and the important part of volatility, is just response to new information. And I think this decline we've seen is, in many, most respects, a response to the fear that the global economy is slowing. Mm -hmm. The fundamentals are there. But I'm afraid uh, it's uh, fundamentals. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, What's, the opinion, what's your opinion on the fact that we're seeing what, 40 uh, US uh, dollar per barrel now for oil when it was, we were talking about 200 US dollar per barrel before? Surely there must be, even though we must make room for volatility, but shouldn't it be managed a bit, at least a bit, in terms of uh, regulators, for example? It's hard to know how to regulate asset prices without creating more damage than you're, than you're solving. I think what you want to regulate are <clears throat> two things. You want to regulate sectors where there are low income households investing in these sectors. You don't want them to be exposed to risks that they don't understand. And you need to protect them from maybe unscrupulous yes. or, or other kinds of, of uh, investment practices. And secondly, you want to regulate risks that are systemic. That is, the risks that affect the system as a whole. And so when banks take on too much risk, and that puts the whole economy in jeopardy, that's, that's a, a position that regulators need to uh, prevent. I have to go for another short break, but when we come back, a lot of these financial institutions are not practically government owned. And uh, you know, with the bailouts and, and all, and a lot of countries in the world also are doing that, but uh, we know that market should be left to its own devices lots of times so that you know, uh, uh, the economy can flourish all around the world. So how do you see this now? You know, uh, Manchester United is, uh, you know, is owned by AIG, for example, a lot of its shares, and now AIG is actually reporting to the President of the uh, United States of America, stuff like that. We have ironies like that now around the world. So how, how would professors see that? And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that after we come back from this short break. <laughs> watching Sirut Pandang and thanks to the International Peace Foundation, I have a Nobel Prize winner here for me to discuss about the national economy and also, you know, volatility of the market and uh, Professor Engel, a lot of institutions, financial institutions, large banks, large amount of funds are now under the control of government.
is this good? Uh, is this a new era? How do we see this? Should, be, should they be looking to get out as soon as possible, giving it back to the market? How would you see it? Well, I think we are in, in a new era. We are we're doing something in the U.S. that we haven't ever done before, or at least in a way that we haven't ever done it before, which is the government has bought shares in the major banks. They, are, uh, they have bought sh actually pretty much ownership of AIG. Yeah. They are talking about buying a big chunk of the automobile industries and, uh, and putting it under, under government What's regulation. Yeah. And so we don't know how that's going to work out. Mm -hmm. It's easy to, to hope that the government can run these institutions better than they can run themselves. Mm -hmm. But we, we can't be that optimistic that people make, that, yeah. make uh, clever decisions at every point in time. And so I think that there will be, this will not last forever. I think that the, uh, the government roles in the banks mm -hmm will be as uh, temporary in the sense that they will try to get them back on their feet mm -hmm. and then they will sell their positions back to the market mm -hmm. and possibly make some money in the process. Yeah. Every crisis is an opportunity. One of the opportunities being mentioned now is that governments, uh, regulators will listen more to people who know more. The academics of uh, the economic uh, world, for example, the economists of the world like you, for example, do you think that you have more say now and uh, people are willing to listen to you more because of what happened? We know that information before. If only we have that and we scrutinize that, we can at least prevent the extent of the magnitude of the crisis, for example. Do you see that happening from now on? There, there is a tremendous interest in new theories, new ideas, understanding of what has happened and what we ought to do in the future. This is partly because the new administration, the Obama administration, has brought a lot of uh, important academics into the planning process and, and looks like it's going to be a very interesting uh, government. We're in the U.S. and I think actually many people around the world are pretty excited about the possibility. I think we shouldn't expect miracles yeah. because it's a tough environment mm -hmm. that he's coming into but at least so far he's doing a very good job and I think there is a feeling that that it's a time for academics to come up with some good ideas mm -hmm. and uh, that they will be heard. So you have confidence with uh, Barack Obama's election of his economic advisors? Right? I think so. Mm -hmm. Do you see the trend now also for the world of economy uh, the world's economy to, to move on to a new footing because, for example, in the exchange rate uh, industry, after Bretton Woods and all that, you know, for decades we haven't really looked back at it and mm -hmm. see whether you know we should change this or that. But now is an opportune moment. Do you think too? Now is an opportune moment. We, everyone's attention in the entire global economy is focused on what should we do, and I think the. The launching of the G20 is an interesting initiative. I hope that that turns out to be something. But there is, there is a lot of discussion about how can we get global oversight on the financial markets to assure the kind of prosperity that we would like and the, the kind of uh, effective financial markets. So there are a lot of proposals around, and I think that it is a time when when uh, governments can be cooperative and show that what the benefits of cooperation really are. I saw your very critical uh, Financial Times short videos. Oh, did you and see that? Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about managing long-term risk and right. long-term run of risk and uh, global warming, for example. We should be addressing the risk now. Right. about carbon emission and all that so that we can tackle the problem in the future. Can you please right. explain that? Yes, I think that there, if there are long-term risks, the financial markets see them now. Investors who are considering putting money in the stock market worry not just about the short-term volatility, but they worry about the long-term risks. And one of the long-term risks that I focused on in that segment was climate risk. If you think that the the climate is going to deteriorate over the next 20 years, it probably 
means that your stock market investment is not going to go up as much as it would otherwise, so you might do less of it. I think a second long-term risk that I'm focusing on my lectures here is the risk of war and terrorism. If there is war, which I think wars and terrorism, I think are natural implications of, of global economic instability, and I think that that will further depress stock markets and hurt local economies. So I think that, that if we can do any public policy to improve either the climate or the um, reducing the possibilities of war and, and terrorism, improving cooperation and economic coordination, that will be a good thing from the point of view of the stock market today. I don't have, I don't have time to ask you about your ice skating ring <laughs> and your favorite fashion, but uh, in Malaysia we've just uh, finished uh, the main exam for high school and uh, maybe a few words from you about whether or not they should be thinking to take up economics as their major study. You know, economics is one of the most interesting fields because it, it combines sort of theory and uh, beautiful stories with everyday reality. And you can, you can help understand the world, and the world is getting to be a bigger and bigger and more and more interesting uh, thing to study. So I, I think economics is a, great, is a great thing to study in school. Look at numbers, the TV series, uh, you know, is, is popular now. <laughs> so thank you so much, Professor Engel, for being here today in Kuala Lumpur with me. Thank you to you uh, for watching, and thanks to the International Peace Foundation at the Bridges series, and uh, thanks to Le Meridian Hotel, KL Central, for hosting this venue. Thank you so much. See you in another episode.